Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my privilege to welcome our 2023 Masters champion, John Rahm. John, congratulations on your victory. 40 years after Seve's second victory and on his birthday, you've become the fourth Spaniard to win the green jacket. Can you walk us through your emotions the moment you sealed the victory? Hard to, hard to put it into words. Uh, obviously, we all dream of things like this as players, and you try to visualize what it's going to be like and, and what it's going to feel like. And uh, when I hit that third shot on the green, and I could tell it was, it was close by the crowd's reaction, uh, just the wave of emotion of so many things just overtook me. Uh, never thought I was going to cry by winning a golf tournament, but I got very close on on that 18th hole. Um, and a lot of it because of, of what it means to me and, and to Spanish golf, right? It's, it's Spain's 10th major, four player to win the Masters, fourth. And uh, my second win, right, my second major win, it's, it's pretty incredible. And, and to play the way I did today on, on Sunday, uh, only one bogey, you know, on difficult conditions and coming in with a margin, oh, hard to explain, you know, a lot, a lot of pride. And I'm really proud of myself from what I did um, and still really hasn't synced in yet. I'm looking at this course and I'm still thinking I have a couple more holes left to, to win and uh, can't really say anything else. You know, this one was for Seve. I know he, he was up there helping and help he did. Thank you, we'll go to questions. Gary. John, everybody in this room knows, uh, but on Tuesday, you shared your appetite for the history of this game and, and talked about how you like to peel back layers on what other players have done. Uh, in addition to the Spanish accomplishment, you're the first European player ever to win a Masters in a U.S. Open. So can you give huh? us a sense, Masters in a U.S. Open, no other European player has, has, has done that. So... Oh. Can you just share, finding that out, just some perspective mm -hmm. on that accomplishment? I find it hard to believe that I'm the first one. You know, there's, if there's anything better than, than accomplishing something like this is making history. So the fact that you told me that to be the first ever to do, first European ever to do that, oh, hard to explain. <laughs> out of all the accomplishments and the many, many great players that have come before me to be the first to do something like that, it's, it's a very humbling feeling. Uh, thank you, by the way, because I don't know how I would have found out. Uh, I still can't believe I'm the first. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. It, it, is, it is a pretty good duo of, of majors. The you know, US Open is about as hard a test that you're ever gonna find. And, you know, I was starting to think I was never going to win a major again unless it was at Torrey Pines. So to, <laughs> to come somewhere that, it's not like it was that long ago, but to come somewhere where I've been comfortable, you know, I kept seeing the stats of lowest score to part of the last starts and, you know, how great I've done here in the past, but never really gave myself a chance to win. And all I asked for was a chance and I got it. So to get that done is, I, I can't hope to feel anything but thankful. John. John, um, just a few minutes ago, Jose Maria talked about how proud he was of how calm, cool, and collected you seemed out there today. How calm, cool, and collected were you? Uh, what is going on on the outside is not always a reflection of the inside. Uh, I was calm. Uh, I never got frustrated. I never really got felt like anything was out of control, but obviously you're nervous, right? There's tension out there. Um, that that bogey on nine, timing-wise, was bad because Jordan and Phil came in making birdies, right? So what looked like a two, possibly more shot lead, uh, narrowed down very, very quickly with the chance of making, then making making a birdie on 18, right? So um, made those 10, 11, 12 holes harder. Uh, again, I might have looked calm, but I was definitely, definitely nervous out there, and uh, I'm glad that's the way it looked. I mean, that's what you strive for, right? You don't want to panic, and I never panicked. I felt comfortable with my game, and I had a plan to execute, and that's all I can do. Cameron. John, uh, you had the, the four putt at the first hole. Uh, you 
might have got the worst and the, 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 the probably the tougher side of the draw. You were getting rained on. Uh, you were also behind for a lot of, a lot of the holes. Um, did you have a sense of calm throughout the week, or how did you sort of keep your composure? Uh, did you say I was uh, perhaps was on the on the bad side of a draw? Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, the only time I was a little bit upset at myself was actually this morning on 16. It was three putted 13, three putted 15, and then I had a terrible shot on 16 and made a bogey. And I felt like at least one of those shots was avoidable. That's the only time I ever felt like, you know, I was truly upset at something. Uh, but I, you know, I reeled it back in and, and made two good parts in the last two holes to, to put myself in the final group, which is all I needed. Uh, so all I asked for was a chance. It was a tough day out there. It, it was windy, and all those wind gusts and, and swirls are not easy. Uh, you're going to hit good shots, or you're going to end up in bad spots, and uh, it happened to everybody. So uh, luckily, the people that shot a low round today were a little bit too far out. Um, and as to, because I know you guys keep asking me, as to why I felt this way, I really don't know. Um, <coughs> I've always been confident when I've been close to the lead. Uh, I have full faith in all parts of my game, and maybe because it was that difficult, Tyler, I was just focused on what I had to do, and that's really all you can control, is what you can do. Jeff. Uh, John, a year ago you played the final round with Tiger Woods. Was there anything from that day that uh, you were able to use today, and, and then perhaps specifically you, you could talk about how you approached the 12th hole today in the final round? Well, I think because he, even though he didn't try to show it, obviously he was in pain, he was tired. The fourth round was, was a long one for him. I didn't really want to just grill him with questions about tournaments, right, and, and how to be a better golfer because he, he was there to do a job. Um, we shared a couple of fun stories. Uh, I asked him a couple of questions about, you know, when he was a younger player and when he became a dad and, and more about you know, life as a pro athlete in parenthood. I think we talked about that more than anything. Then he shared a couple of stories from the past. Uh, but the one thing I remember is talking to Tony Finau. I played nine holes with him on Wednesday, about 12, because you mentioned. And I asked him when him and Francesco hit those shots in the water, it was like, did you actually hit a good shot? And he said, yeah, it was a good shot. It was just a yard too far right and spun in the water. So then he mentioned that Tiger's shot went left of the bunker to that Sunday pin. Um, so when I got there today, dry land is mission number one, right? And then uh, it was very similar conditions to what we played this morning. So I learned from what I did this morning, tried to basically make a hole in one to the third round pin and hit a perfect shot because I was about three feet from it, right? That's, that's all I had to do, hit it right over the center of the bunker and hope it hits green. So, and then after that, hit a great lag pod, tapped it in and moved on. Jeffrey. A lot of people want to describe you as a fighter. Where does that come from? I don't know. Um, maybe it's a little bit related to determination. Um, you know, I'm, I'm out there. When I'm out there, I have a job to do, and it's to hopefully be here answering to this question, right? So uh, I put in, we all, I mean, I know we all do, but we put in a lot of effort to try to beat the best guys in the world. So um, maybe that level of intensity and that determination is what you see, and that's why you're I'm characterized as a fighter. I'm also never going to give up, no matter what, right? If I can, even if I shoot myself out of contention, whatever, and I can finish strong to give myself a possibility to finish fourth, it's always going to be better than anything, right? So um, I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I didn't try my hardest in every shot. So that's maybe why where it comes from. John. John, can you remember the moment where you first thought that you'd like to win this tournament and how have you changed from that day until now? Oh God, I, I can't remember exactly when. <sighs> but I mean, I, I've wanted to win it ever since I thought about, about golf and, and what being a champion would be, right? Obviously, there's four great tournaments we all think of and not to categorize them in any order, right? This one is one of them. Uh, I think the main thing, uh, something that gave me a lot of hope, 
And that kind of started when Sergio won in 17, is the fact that basically every, pretty much every great name Spanish player had won here, right? I was like, there's got to be something here about having a Spanish passport. I don't know. This is something about, about the grounds that, that transmits into all of us. And uh, even that year, I play good. I play good every year. Uh, I can't pinpoint exactly the first time, but it really made, became clear to me that year. Martin. John, how exciting is it to be halfway towards the Grand Slam and, and be in a race now with Jordan Spieth and, and Rory and perhaps even Phil? <laughs> Let's not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are three of them. Uh, I mean, it would be amazing. It would be great. It's um, not many people have been able to do it. And to be able to finish it out and close out and do a, a Grand Slam would be absolutely amazing. I don't know how else to say. Uh, I would like to say that I entered the race when I won the US Open, but of course it was so far away you don't want to think about it, right? But uh, as players, it's on your mind, right? It's on your mind. It's, it's something that it would be amazing, but it's, it's a long road ahead to be able to accomplish that, something that Two players like Phil and Arnie weren't able to do. You know, it speaks a lot. Scott. Dan, you started the week with a double bogey, and this morning you woke up with a four-shot deficit that you quickly made two, and then within a few holes today you were tied for the lead with one birdie. Uh, how do you switch from chasing all week to being chased for the, the last 12 holes? It really doesn't change. Um, not as much as you should, obviously. I like to still stay aggressive, uh, as it shows with my play on 16. Uh, the second I try to play for pars is when I think a big number comes into play, right? So with how good I was swinging, I like to stay aggressive. And if I have a three-shot lead, try to make it four. You're four, try to make it five. That's a goal, right? That's, that's the intention. Uh, just so you can go on 18 and, and mess up and still have a... <laughs> A pretty good look at one in the tournament, kind of like I almost did today, like Scotty did last year, right? You just you want to have as much lead as you can. Uh, the goal at that point is to never come back to the rest of the field, right? To have them chase you, and knowing that if I could make a few birdies and pars, especially on the back nine, it was going to be pretty difficult for someone to catch up with the wind conditions today. Dylan. Yeah, John, when you're playing in the same group as the, the guy that you know you're competing with, is there anything you try to do to uh, gain a competitive advantage? Obviously, it's not match play, but you and Brooks were side by side for a lot of holes today. It's not match play, but early on, it kind of felt like it, right? Uh, before people made all those birdies, I mean, we were 10, 10, 11, I was, yeah, after the birdie on three, 10, 11 under, and then the closest was five under, right? So it kind of felt like that situation where I, I wasn't expecting Brooks to play bad. I can't expect that, right? So I need to bring the fight to him. So when I took the T on four, the goal is to keep giving him something to look at, meaning if I hit a good shot, just for him to see that I have a birdie chance, but keep putting the ball in the fairway and keep making good swings for him to feel more of the pressure than me, right? Me to be, be the one pushing. And I feel like I did that really, really well. And even at the end, when, when things changed, he was the one that started pushing and made those birdies on 15 and 16, right? So even at that point, the dynamic changed a little bit as well. Adam. When did you figure out or did someone tell you that the final round of the Masters this year was going to be on Seve's birthday? Uh, I think it was on Tuesday right here. Uh, well, not in the press room, but uh, I think it was while I was doing media that it was Seve's birthday. Yeah, I was told a lot of things about why this could be the year, and I just didn't want to buy into it too much. Or if you don't mind, um, did you sense today that the patrons were more behind you than in past years? Uh, yeah, not, not throughout the entire round, because obviously early on there was a lot of options and Brooks was on the lead and the people supporting Brooks made themselves uh, known. Uh, but I think it was around my birdie on eight when I took a, a couple stroke lead is when things turned a little bit. Even with that bogey on nine, 
the support was pretty incredible all throughout. And I kept hearing, Savvy, 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 do it for Savvy. I heard that the entire back nine. And that might have been the hardest thing to, to control today is, you know, the emotion of knowing what it could be if I were to win. That might have been the hardest thing. John, we really should ask you about the fantastic shot into 14, but sh shall we ask you about the shot, uh, tee shot on 18 instead? Can you just describe what you were uh, thinking as you reached for a provisional ball on the 72nd hole? Nothing really. Uh, had a four shot lead, so I was confident with that. Uh, but uh, I think that was karma. I was just telling Adam how great I hit a low fade the entire week, it pretty much every the fairway, all four days in 17, which I've never done. And I was bragging about it a little bit. And of course, on 18, that happens, right? Which was maybe two feet from missing that tree, but uh, it'll be a good story in the future, I guess, right? I won the Masters, didn't even make it to the fairway on the tasting tee shot. Uh, I much rather want to remember that second shot on 14, because if there was a key moment throughout the day, it was that shot, right? Uh, not timing behind the tree, but not in the great spot to hit it to four feet was was incredible. I'm sorry, what was the yardage you had in on 18? 128 <coughs> meters on 18? Yeah. Please. Oh, I thought you were going to say 14. <laughs> I don't even know. Did you, Adam uh, started Adam, saying Adam, numbers. I was like, is it worth going for the green? No. So I just grabbed the four iron and faded around the tree into a pitch spot. Just a couple more questions, Kevin. Or Doug. No, I'm sorry. John, I actually did want to ask you about the yardage on 14 and what club that was. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I was figured somebody good. was going to ask. Uh, it was 128 meters um, adjusted, and I used an 8 iron. And it was, yeah, started around left edge of the green. All I had to do was fade about five yards, and he would reach that slope. You, you talk about Eamon Cormorant. When you leave 14 with that great birdie and you're four up with four to play, um, does that become easy or difficult? It doesn't make it easier or more difficult. At the end, I, I still wanted to play those last four holes under par. That was the goal, uh, knowing that if I did that, it would, again, it was going to be pretty much not impossible, but very difficult for me to lose it. And last question in English. Uh, Don, a couple years ago, sorry, right here, down front. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> okay. A couple of years ago, you made a decision to reveal a pretty vulnerable thing that you were born with a club foot, and I was kind of curious what made you want to share that with people. What what inspired the the explanation of that? Oh, it's, it's not. I mean, it's not a vulnerable thing. Um, mm -hmm. You can't see it because I wear pants. If I, if we wore shorts in golf, you guys would have noticed way earlier. Uh, I I dropped hints as a professional in this pressers many times, and it was in the twenty. 20 Open Championship when somebody finally decided to ask a follow-up question to that and ask me what I meant and and that's when I explained it to it. I mean, I'm not going to go out here and and explain everything that goes on, right? So nah, that was it. Somebody finally asked a follow-up question and, and I decided to talk about it. Nothing nothing else. It wasn't like a, a moment where I felt ready. It's just something I'm pretty open about. This is the reason why I have the swing I have and the mechanics I have is is part of who I am. And a few questions in Spanish. Juan. Primero, que nos describas un poco las emociones del día, ¿no? Y en qué momentos has sentido que eran clave y que te ibas a poner la chaqueta, ¿no? ¿En qué momento he sentido? Sí. Hombre, no me quería adelantar, ¿no? Pero cuando he pegado el tercer golpe del 18 cerca de Bandera, que sabía estaba cerca de ella, he dejado que que mi mente se fuese a ese digamos, a esa zona, ¿no? Eh, casi me pasa en el 17, el cuatro golpes de ventaja y tal, pero luego le pega al árbol. <risa> eh, pero ya no quería, digamos, creérmelo hasta que ya era algo fijo. Y esto viene de, no, no solo de deportista y de estar ahí en, en esa situación, ¿no? Me acuerdo leyendo el libro de Rafa Nadal, uh, cuando habla de esa final de 2008 con, de Wimbledon con Federer, que pega pega un gran, un gran golpe, no sé si lo dices, el golpe en tenis, eh, que le puso un punto arriba en el tie break. Es la, dice que es la primera vez que se dejó pensar en la victoria. Creo que era el cuarto set. Y luego perdió los dos siguientes, los dos o tres siguientes puntos y fue a un quinto set. ¿no? Y, y explica cómo el permitirse pensar en la victoria es lo que le hizo perder ese set. Y hay pensamientos de ganar que van a venir realmente, pero lo que no hay que hacer es 
perderse en ellos y mantenerse en lo que es importante en el momento. Ignacio. John here. Um, oh, in, in Spanish or yeah, Spanish, Spanish, yeah. Spanish. Um, el, el Masters entrega cosas muy importantes que, que permanecen en la vida. El, el saco, venir a la cena de campeones, venir a jugar durante toda tu vida golfista, el, el Masters. Esas cosas ya están empezando a, pens, a, a pesar en tu, en tu mente ahora todo lo que, todo lo que eso significa. No, ni cerca de haberlo procesado todavía. Lo único, que, lo único que sé que va a pasar, porque se lo prometí, es que el cocinero José Andrés me va a abrazar con el menú todo el año. Es lo único que te puedo, te puedo prometer, que, prometer que eso va a pasar. Eh, el resto no, no, todavía no... Digamos, no he dejado que, mi, que, que, que la mente o los pensamientos vayan tan adelante, ¿no? Eh, más que nada porque hay veces que me cuesta salir de ese modo de competición, ¿no? que, que sigo pensando que hay algo más que hacer para ganar. Eh, así que me imagino que esta tarde, mañana, algún día de estos vendrá, vendrá, vendrá presente, ¿no? pero de momento no, es casi como que no me doy cuenta, no sé, es, algo, es algo extraño, no sé cómo explicarlo, pero un honor el poder venir aquí el resto de mi vida y un honor el año que viene poder darles una buena cena en el norte de España, una buena zona vasca, eh, que bueno, que José Andrés me ayudará con ello, me imagino. Y una más de Juan en español. Eh, so, la importancia histórica para España y para Europa que tiene esto, y, y pues eso, y, si te das la cuenta ya de lo que significa, ¿no? no hombre, el, el décimo grande de España, ¿no? Y, el, y la quinta cha, quinta chaqueta. ¿Sexta? No, sí. se ve ganó, es verdad. Sí, sí, sexta. Sexta, coño. La sexta, es que ya me ando perdido. Eh, la sexta. Pues qué decir, es que no sé. Me, me, me cuesta explicarlo porque verle a ganar a Sergio fue increíble, ¿no? Y, y eso hace como español que vengas y, y de verdad te creas que aquí hay algo especial para españoles, ¿no? Que, que es nuestro destino poder jugar aquí bien. Y el hecho de que eh, los tres grandes jugadores antes de mí hayan conseguido ganarlo y yo a tan, digamos, temprana edad he conseguido ganarlo, es todo un honor. Y ojalá pueda añadir más y ojalá pueda seguir añadiendo. Y eso de, de ser el primer europeo que gana el Masters y el US Open, todavía no me lo creo. Eso te lo puedo decir. Me cuesta creer que sea yo el primero y la verdad que eso es todo un honor. Y antes de concluir, si pudieras ir por tu scorecard en términos de birdies y bogies y los clubes que has hit en y distancias para los birdies y bogies. ¿Every hole? Uh, no, just the birdies and bogeys. Looks like. Uh, oh, the, sorry, the birdies. So three. Um, every round? No, no, just the final. <laughs> okay, so birdie on three. It was driver had 43 meters to the pin. It used the lob wedge. Um, landed two paces short. Released six. How much detail do I need to get into? No, that that's good. Okay. <laughs> Eight, Eight. Driver three wood into a hurricane. Had. 51 meters to the pin and used to used to lob wedge hit a low runner. Uh, 13 driver six iron to pin high just left of the green. Uh, decided to pitch it and gave myself a pretty pretty good look at birdie from four feet. And then 14 128 meters eight iron around the tree. Pin high. Great. Well, John, congratulations. Thank you for being with us and what an incredible accomplishment. Thank you. Great.